<laughs> thank you. That's great. Yeah, thank you. That was great. How nice to Finally see you. I only get settled in. <laughs> yes, I did miss the group, but um, yeah, I was busy getting a lot of tour, direct tour learning from the Holy Land. So yeah, it was great. That's great. Let's get settled in. Welcome but back. I'll be back. Thanks. Thank you. So there are two Torah portions. It's actually we're reading this weekend uh, around the world, Tazria and Mitzora, that deal with this spiritual skin affliction, which we've never experienced, but and we're not really going to get into the details of the, the dermatology types of it because we're not we're not dealing with it, and we there's there's much we really don't understand practically if we've never seen it. But there are definitely um, spiritual lessons and insights for us to take. And it's, uh, as I said, it's this week's Torah portion. This is the second of the two Torah portions. We're about halfway through, maybe. And it, this is about. I do my glasses. Um, it, it's 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 about the the um, the affliction itself. The second of the Torah portions is not so much about assessing the affliction and, and what's done, but it's really about the purification. Um, once a per the, the afflicted person had taken time off and was uh, they were sequestered outside of the camp and they started to really think things through and they started to hopefully also recognize uh, more the value of human relationships, family and communal and take more deeply their responsibility to protecting those relationships and not god forbid hurting them meaning that they, they you know not to, to refrain from go gossip and so on so there was a a at a, at a level this was a it was a um it was a, a course correction for the person and that part of that was was getting out of the out of town and take spending time and 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 personal um contemplation so what we'd said was that that their re-entry had a couple of stages actually there was at one point wherever they were there was imparting a certain spiritual impurity a contamination to the house or the neighborhood they had to be able to get out of there then at a certain point it was deemed uh, uh, you know uh, working towards healing and the coin would declare the person as as being past the, the danger zone of of Mitsura, but that it, and there was a, a, a service but then they had to actually um continue going forward still being out of town but they there was they were imparting uh, lower levels let's call it that of the spiritual impurity but they still had to their, their re-entry had an extra stage and now they were they were uh, had this where we ended off they had to spend another week outside and we're up to verse 9 on page 105 and says now after in, in this in this uh, second stage uh, they're waiting a week and on the seventh day he and again it's a he and the she but it, it's interesting uh, and um, commentaries comment on why they, they they frame it um it's it's sometimes the the neutral is 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 masked and there's nothing to do about it but they they uh, does specify a few times here that a man well, it's really not about a man it's about a human being well this he must again shave off all his hair at this time, only that which similar to the hair on his head, his beard, and his eyebrows. So he, he the, 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 um, um, the Tsaras afflicted person. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Rabbi, where are you? I'm trying to follow. On 105. Yeah. Uh, verse 9. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, so he is shaves all his, all his hair on his head. And on his beard and his eyebrows. In other words, he must shave off all his hair from the places on his body where there's usually a visible dense growth of hair. So halachically, that means you just look where there's there's uh, there's the clumps, there's more dense growth of hair that had to be um, cut off, shaved, and then must then get immerse his garments and immerse his flesh in the waters of mikvah and thus be purified to an even greater degree, although still not yet completely. And on the, the classic commentaries on the Torah. Notes that it was on the is shaving off the hair on the head, and around the mouth, and on the eyes. 
of the eyebrows. And it, it notes that why that that the uh, this symbolizes that in 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 gossip there's a, a there are contributing um, elements that bring us the, to uh, bring a person to to um, speak gossip. First, they have to think about it. They have to, their, their head has to be in that way, in the way they think. And there's a certain arrogance that could come, so or self-importance, or or could be resentment. It depends on what it is. But certainly, the 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 perspective, uh, person to person to per perspective, is is one that that is needs help. And that's why the head, say, of the intellect and the perspective, has to be shaven off. In other words, we're we're trying to get that back to basics and cleanse that. Part of it is the eyebrows and the eyes, because it's how we see someone, talk about perspective. And often, it you know, it's it, 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 we're looking at someone with with uh, some resentment, could be because we we begrudge them something, or wherever it is, we're projecting something. But it's it's about the perspective, and ultimately, obviously, it's about the mouth and what we're saying. So there's that's where the hair is also um, uh, shaved from. Now, I want to throw in because we it bounce around a little bit in the the Talmudic interpretations of of what brings Saras, It's clearly conduct that is not befitting. It's it's gossip. It's it's uh, it, it's um, slander. And that's not you know that that doesn't speak well of a person's moral moral character. At the same time. We spoke about all the way in the beginning when we first got into this conversation, the language presented as, as a person of some stature, moral stature, and it's specifically such a person whose soul afflictions show themselves on the body. And we're going to get into that still. There is this, this tension, from both from Talmudic sources, where some, on the one hand, where we are describing saying this is the, the human being who's affected as a, affected as a person who's an evolved human being, and that's why this this shows up because it's really beneath them. On the other hand, we're really decon, um, highlighting the the behavior as really being not behavior that would be shown by a person of, of great stature. So. Um, yet, either it's that we find it that much more offensive because it's a person of great stature, but we have to take it out of that context and talk about for us people who aren't of such great stature, or it's that you know it's that's where it is, but we're, we're spreading it around in, in, in lesson wise, not just for what happened that there historically, uh, with the, that it, it went, it was more uh, uh, targeted. For people of great stature, but for the ages, we're talking about it as, as something which is not just for that; it's for all of us to be able to learn. But there is going to be this balance where we're talking about, you know, here's some of the bad perspectives, the grudging, and so on. And then, then we're going to say this is a person of of uh, considerable stature. Now, on the eighth day, verse ten, you must take two unblemished male lambs in their first year and one unblemished male, male lamb in its first year in order to sacrifice them. One as an ascent offering, one as the guilt offering, one as a sin offering. That's the four different types of basic offerings when we started this book. And, and here there'll be three out of the four, as it will be inscribed presently. All three of these offerings require accompanying grain offerings and wine libations, even though, as you will be taught later, guilt offerings and sin offerings are not generally accompanied by grain offerings and wine libations. Therefore, in addition to the three animals, the person being purified must take three separate tenths of an ephah of vine flour, each mixed with a quarter of hin of, of olive oil as a grain offering to accompany, accompany each animal sacrifice, plus three quarter hins of wine for the libations accompanying each animal sacrifice. In addition, he must take one lug of olive oil for the purification rites, as will be presently described. Then, good morning, Lori. Um, we go to verse 11. There is another outlier, something, a, an unusual um, element of this offering is that the priest, the, the Kohen, is, who's performing the purification must position the person being purified together with these things or they're, or they're doing for bringing for the offering before God, meaning outside the entrance of the courtyard of the tent of meeting. So there, in, in the, in the, in the, there's this um, sanctuary area, which is holy. Not everybody can go in there. The priest is there. 
the person who's a, a, afflicted by this spiritual impurity and balance that's, that comes with the tzaras, with, the, with the, the, the skin affliction, they can't go in there. Well, they, they, so the person cannot actually uh, yet actually enter the tabernacle precinct since he's not completely purified of his defilement. So what would be is, and it, but it said you, they would come right outside the entrance. Usually if someone couldn't go in, you meet some of them somewhere outside or someone else brings it in and, and, and uh, they, 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 they have an agent take care of it for them. Here, you brought the person in who has this issue and or had this issue because now they've really considerably gotten past it. They're just sort of trying to get past the last vestiges of it. They do, they come as close as possible to the door. And the priest must take one male lamb and bring it into the courtyard in order to sacrifice it as a guilt offering along with a log of oil before slaughtering the lamb. You must wave them, the lamb and the oil as a wave offering before God. And if, let's go to, to 106. And, and we're, as we're going to see that really the, the priest actually puts oil on, the, on this person's um, um, ear, someone, part, different parts of the body. So it, the, the person is very close. They're not in the sanctuary, but they're very close to the sanctuary, and they're really part of the service, but they're just across the threshold. And one of the things that the Talmud tells us about this is that here you're not just talking about someone, again, this spiritual impurity, which also we don't have uh, uh, functionally for a couple of thousand years, but uh, the, the idea of, let's say, a touch a dead rodent, I can't go into the sanctuary. I can't eat the, the sacred foods. I have to go through this process of cleansing myself. It's not a, a moral blemish. It's, uh, I touched the rodent. That's, uh, it, it's what I did, or I did something even good. I went and I was, I was uh, I, 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 part of burying my neighbor. But there is this, the, we discussed that several times, spiritual imbalance that comes from being in touch with death. Here, there was a moral problem. It's called gossip. And the healing wasn't just about wait, uh, uh, waiting time and going to the mikveh and going through hoops. It was really about introspection and get, repositioning their mind to, to keep to be um, to to refrain from anything that that brings division between people, uh, between family or between friends. So that's a person we say that's called teshuva. It's called repentance. So here, what you have is not your average person with spiritual impurity who's bringing an offering. You're, bring, you're talking about someone who has really refined themselves. And the reason they're there is because the, the lesion has started to recede because they're, they're spiritually, they're healing, psycho-spiritually, they're healing. And that's why it's showing on the skin. So now the Torah stretches things so that this person, even though they technically can't come to the sanctuary, they're as close as they can. And a person in the sanctuary is reaching over the threshold to be able to engage them. So they're, they're engaging with someone in the sanctuary. They're just not there. So we're kind of stretching the parameters of, no, you can't come into the sanctuary. Well, you can do everything but actually walk into the sanctuary. You can even be engaged with a person who's standing on the other side of the threshold in the sanctuary as part of this process. And the reason, one of the reasons we're showing that is that the how God... Um, stretches things, so to, this thing, so to speak, to make things easier for a person who is uh, trying to, to regain access, so regain, regain connection with God because it, 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 through introspection and, and self-refinement. The language of the Talmud is that, uh, that uh, you know, before God's uh, heavenly throne, there's, there's a way to, to, to approach. And, but then God also, uh, the language is like uh, uh, bores tunnels underneath the throne for those who uh, who want to come in you know through uh, not having done everything correctly but through the, the, the power of their own self-improvement and reflection and and uh, um, restructuring of their of their perspective on life so God, so to speak, stretches the parameters to make room for us if we're trying to to really to make space for our for God in our lives, even if it's not exactly all ideal and it, we're not coming from an ideal place, but we mean it very much here. So here, so you, you can't come into the sanctuary, but you're going to come as close as possible, or or so to speak, you know, can't come through the throne room. You can come 
you know, through the, the, the floor, uh, through the, a tunnel under the, the, the throne. Page 106. 13, verse 13. Even though this guilt offering is exceptional in that it must be positioned at the entrance of the courtyard before being slaughtered, the priest must still slaughter the lamb in the place where one slaughters the sin offering and the scent offering, just like the old guilt offerings, meaning within the holy place, the courtyard north of the outer altar. So there, it, there is, it, it, it is unique that it's brought to the entrance of the courtyard, but then it, it has to follow the regular rules of where we slaughter these, these different offerings. Now, the, furthermore, despite the fact that the purification rites require special applications of this offering's blood, as what we described presently, his blood must still be applied to the altar and its fat burned up upon the altar. So here, some of the blood goes on uh, with on the person itself, but he, but uh, in, usually the the blood goes on the altar as part of the blood from an offering, and that still applies. Regarding these aspects of the priest's service, the guilt offering, including this one, is like the sin offering. Nonetheless, just as the blood of the other of other guilt offerings is applied to the lower half of the altar by sprinkling it at the two diagonally opposite altars, unlike the blood of sin offerings, which is applied to the provisions of the altar. So is the case with this guilt offering. It is a sacrifice of superior holiness like all other guilt offerings. Its blood is therefore applied to the altar in the same way as that of all other guilt offerings. So the, the blood, there is, it's this Tzara's offering has some outlier parts to it, but then as far as the, the, the service part of it, the offering part of it, it has to really follow the standard of other offerings. But then after the lamb is slaughtered in 14, the priest must take some of the blood of the guilt offering and the priest must apply it above the middle ridge of the right ear of the person being purified on the thumb of his right hand, on the, the big toe of his right foot. The priest must then take some of the log of oil and pour it onto the priest in the other, his own left palm. And then the priest must then dip his right index finger into some of the oil that is on his left palm. And sprinkle some of the oil with his index finger seven times in the direction of the holies. This, this is being considered before God. Okay, so here there, there are a few things. It's just it's an uh, it, it's a, a ritual you probably wouldn't have thought about it on your own, nor would I. But one of the things that the commentaries tell us is that the, there is there's a lot of symbolism here about the. The, the conduct, the behavior that goes with malicious talk. Let's say it's gossip, but it's malicious, divisive talk. First of all, we 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 use for the offering these birds, and we have discussed once the, the chirping of the birds represents this the unnecessary talking. Part of what gets us into trouble is when we we feel like we have to say something. And we just don't have, you know, anything that we feel comfortable sharing that's going to be interesting to someone. So one of the easier things is just to talk about people. So that's, and although this isn't a comment, on, any moral comment on birds, but that's the, the chirping of the birds and the birds are used in this, in this, uh, as, as part of this, this offering. And the, one of the things I say here is that, first of all, we take, blood the blood is um and, and one of the, the representations of it and this is the Talmud that says pretty explicitly is that as um, malicious talk about people is like shedding their blood now shedding blood it means murder or injury you know it's you know here you said words you god forbid didn't actually hurt someone but aside from the fact that words can cut very deep and that the Talmud wants us to think about it conceptually is, you know, here's someone I wouldn't hit, punch them or stab them, but I'm, yet I'm willing to, to, to stab them conceptually, virtually by saying negative things about them. Maybe I should see more of a, 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 a comparison between the two because, you know, I would never hurt them, but I am hurting. I would never hurt them physically. So, but why is it okay to hurt them emotionally? Um, and in their reputation. And so there is this idea of, of spilling blood. 
um, Talmud also says that they, you know, just the, the, when a person, the the embarrassment that a person feels of being spoken about, that's also the, the blood rushing to the face symbolizes the the you know the triggering of blood that we create in another person. At the same time, we have the oil, which in in Torah thinking, in, in Torah language, and it's in the Psalms, the idea is that you know it's a, a, a smooth tongue. It says, it says, or it, it's like a person who says like their words are dripping with oil. I, I come across as as very eloquent and very and very smooth. So there that that uh, we have, so one of the things we're, we're we're putting over here as part of the uh, as part of the uh, service is the dabbing of the blood and of the oil because it it may we may be presenting it the words may be presented in a in a, a smooth way so it doesn't come across so blatantly as being you know coarse backstabbing but it what really is it if you think about it, that no matter how it looks no matter how smooth we make it it, it can often if it's something that that uh, conceptually sheds someone's blood we can stay away from that and we we put it we said on on the ear because the ear is also is it's part of this is what we hear and also it's what we accept and the ears here are are so ones that that are really unfortunately part of the negative action both that we're hearing something we probably and often we hear and we're spreading it but maybe even worse than that is that other people hear it and now their minds are shifted we've just shifted how they think about this person and or maybe we've just created you know with one thing did you hear do you know what he says about you or what she says about you you've created now even if a person doesn't 100% buy it or they see it as manipulative, it, it creates a wall between the, the, the hearer, the listener, and the person who is who purportedly says something negative about them. So this is how words divide. So it, it goes on the ear for that, for that reason too. And one of the things is also the, the on the, the toe, because in the, in the Torah's language later on, in this book, we'll, we'll get to the idea is not not to to walk as a tail bearer amongst your people. In other words, it's it's that we go out and we spread our wares, so we're we're seeding the area with this negativity. So it goes on on the feet too, and one of this also on the thumbs. We say that that what we the, the correct way would be when we hear it is to ask someone to, to please stop talking. And that didn't happen, you know, that we, we, we seized the, the, the malicious talk. That's also part of what goes into this um, process of rehabilitation. So go to 17. The priest must then apply some of the remainder of the oil that is in his palm to the middle ridge of the right ear of the person being purified and the thumb of the right hand on the big toe of his right foot on the places where he just applied the blood of the guilt offering. It does not matter if the blood is still there or if it's white off in the meantime. The priest must then apply what is left over from the oil in the priest, meaning his own palm on, on the head of the person being purified. The priest will thus effect partial atonement for him before God. Priest must then offer up the female lamb as a sin offering, thereby effecting additional atonement for the person being purified of the defilement. After this, he must slaughter the second male lamb as an assembly. As opposed to the guilt offering and sin offering, only parts of which are burned up on the altar, the priest must bring the entire scent offering, just like it's offering, accompanying grain offering, up to the top of the altar in order to bring it up there. The priest must eat their portions of the guilt offering and sin offerings, and the priest must will thus effect complete atonement for him and will be completely purified. Okay. Next, purification from Sarat for a poor person, because a poor person can't afford necessarily all the things for the, that we need for an offering. So the Torah gives a sliding scale of what can be done. And they, they have to do less. One of the things that the, the Talmud comments upon this is that, you know, generally in Torah thinking, when people uh, have, they suffer. We can't come up with a better word. But suffer in their in their human lives and physical lives. That's part of of atonement. It helps cleanse our souls of spiritual toxins that we that we have. And one of the things we say is that a person who suffers 
the, the, the pressures and the indignity of poverty, it's very difficult. And therefore the Torah sees them not only as, well, you're not able to afford, so we're going to be nice to you and let you um, bring a, a lesser amount of offering. They say that part of the purification has already happened because of their human suffering. Even if they're not sitting in meditation talking about the malicious talk, they already they have a leg up on um, self-refinement because the, they're living a life with... with um, with the, the the stresses that come with um, with financial uh, inabilities. Okay. So, and um, verse twenty one says, if the person is poor and cannot afford these sacrifices, he can use fowl instead of lamb for the sin offering and the sent offering. Now, to the right side of one hundred six here at the bottom. It says, thus you must take one male lamb of the guilt offering, first to be waved as a wave offering to affect the atonement frame, one tenth of an eighth of a fine flour mixed with oil as an accompanying grain offering for the guilt offering, a quarter hin, which is a, 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 another biblical measurement of wine for its accompanying libation, a log of oil for the pure, uh, purification of it. Then we'll go to the top of 107. And we see hey, we, could, we also this person also brings two turtle doves or two young pigeons, which are even less expensive than turtle doves. So it's, again, it's a sliding scale. If they can afford turtle doves, take them. According to what he can afford, one is a sin offering, and the other is an ascent offering. You must bring them to the priest on the eighth day of his purification to the entrance of the courtyard of the tent of meeting. This being considered before God. Okay, so there was one stage. We said then there's the, uh, another stage of purification before they re-entry into the community. There's a, a seven day process, and then the eighth day. The bringing of this offering, the, the the priest must then take the guilt offering lamb and the log of oil, bring them inside the courtyard, and the priest must wave them as a, a wave offering before God. He must slaughter the guilt offering lamb. The priest must then take some of the blood of the guilt offering, apply it to the on the middle ridge of the right ear of the person being purified, on the thumb of his right hand, on the big toe of his right foot. The priest must then pour some of the oil onto the priest, meaning his own left palm. The priest must sprinkle with his right index finger some of the oil that is in his left palm seven times in the direction of the Holy Holies, this being considered before God. The priest must then apply some of the remainder of the oil that is in his palm onto the um, <clears throat> middle edge of the right ear of the person being purified on the thumb of his right hand on the big toe of his right foot. In the same place where he just applied the blood of the guilt offering, it does not matter if the blood is still there if it is wiped off in the meantime. 29, the priest will then apply, for, apply what is left over from the oil in the priest, meaning his own palm upon the head of the person being purified in order to affect partial atonement for him before God. He's then offer up some of the two turtle doves or one of the two young pigeons, whichever the person being purified can afford. As part of offering up uh, uh, both of which over ever of these two types of family can afford, and one of the sodden offering another, and the sent offering. The priest must offer up these fowl after having offered up the grain offering accompanying the guilt offering. The priest will thus effect atonement for the person being purified before God. This is the law regarding someone suffering from a lesion of tzarat, but who cannot afford the full array of what is to be, when he, when he is to be purified. So now we, we've taken care of that one. We are now up to the fourth Torah reading in this second Torah portion. We're going to get to tzarat and homes. We had mentioned before that there was... In the, the um, sequencing, first people would see it on the homes, and hopefully they would uh, they saw tzarat on their homes, which is a supernatural occurrence. They would hopefully that would open their eyes to um, the, their need for uh, course correction. If that didn't work, it would. The, come on to clothing and that didn't uh, if they still didn't um, work themselves out it, it went to their body so it's present in the Torah in the opposite we first started with on the body and the bo and then uh, the laws of so it, we go in decreasing um, severity of the, of the experience into clothing and then into the homes now, Sarat and Homs. God spoke to Moses, instructing him to convey his words there and for him to say to the Israelites in God's name, when you enter Canaan, because they didn't have, they, they're in the desert here, and unbeknownst to them, they're going to be there for another 39 years at this point. But um, 
it, so they don't have homes. They, they have tents. Cool. Once they're go, they're headed towards Israel, Canaan, and they're going to build themselves homes. So when you enter Canaan, which I'm giving you as a possession, you will dispossess the nations who presently occupy the land and be able to inhabit the homes they inhabit now. And you're gonna gonna come. So real, they're gonna come and they're gonna want to live in peace, and they're not gonna be able. The the Canaanites are not going to let them live in peace, and therefore there's going to be war, and they're going to um, ultimately take over the cities and and um, this. The 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 Amor the Canaanite tribes will be leaving any of these cities because they've started to war with us and they 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 lost that. Of these nations, the Amorites in particular are fully aware of God's promise to Abraham that you will dispossess them. Now, God told Abraham not to, to dispossess them, that you're going to come to the Canaanite to, to, to get this land. God is saying, I'm going to give you this land. You can go live there. So the Amorites knew about that. And since in that very promise, God stated that the dispossession will be a punishment for the sins, they also cherish the hope that God will likewise someday punish you for your sins and exile you from the land, by which time they will be free to repossess it and move back into their homes. So these Amorites are not stupid. They know history. And they say, okay, so it's we're being the Israelites are coming in because we have corrupted the land with our, our behavior. So God's going to punish us and and give this land to, to the Israelites, the Hebrews. My, uh, the, but we Amorites are saying, you know, something they're human just like we are. Maybe they eventually they're also going to get corrupt and then we'll be able to come back in and it'll be our turn. The life is a pendulum. Thus, some of them have been stashing their gold in the walls of their houses ever since you left Egypt. This is just a, an interesting uh, thing, but it's definitely it's brought up in the Talmud that here, when when God tells them about about the houses, the language is kind of like, "I got some good news for you. Huh? I have good news for you that's that there's going to be these uh, these diseases on your houses, this 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 supernatural wackiness. So good news is that there the Amor Amorites are going to be storing, they, they're going to find ways because they know that you're going to come into the land and they're going to fight you, and that God has forecasted that you're going to win, which means they're going to have to, to flee. What they can do with with everything? How how much can they flee with? So they found ways to hide their their assets in a way they hope you will not find it, and eventually you'll be out and they'll come back in and they'll have their assets with them. So therefore, and they, they're doing this since you left Egypt because they knew what what God had told Abraham hundreds of years before. Therefore, do not fret when I place I place a tzarat legion upon a house in the land of your possession. For even if on that account you are forced to demolish your house, you will thereby reveal these hidden treasures and gain considerable wealth. So what's going to happen? You're going to have tzarat in your house. That's a real pain. In the neck. As we're going to learn, study sometimes. As a result of the tzarat, yeah, the tzarat, you have to actually dismantle the house. So, but you know something? When you dismantle these homes, you're going to find some assets that were hidden there by the Amorites because they figured that's, that's uh, you know, a safe way of, whole, of, of uh, storing their gold while they know they're going to be fleeing because they figure they're coming back. And they, 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 what, how are you going to know it's inside the walls? But uh, when you, when, uh, uh, because of tzarat, you are compelled to dismantle the walls, you're going to find some really good surprises. Okay, so here it says, do not fret. Um, it's not in the bold. It doesn't say that in the Torah. Uh, uh, what it says in the Torah is just, uh, it, it, I mean, none of this is, is clear in the verse. When the, verse the, the, words, the, ver the words that it says in the verse, when you come to Canaan that I give you, then uh, I will... I will also give you this idea of sarat in your homes. But I will give you as though it's a gift. Sarat is, is a hassle, not a gift. But it's, there's a, a hidden gift here. So it says, do not fret. I don't know why they highlight that, because again, it's not actually in, in the Torah. But let's look at 34, the Hasidic insights at the bottom, all the way to the left. 
as stated, only some, probably only a small fraction of the Canaanites hid their gold in the walls of their homes before driven, being driven out of them. It was these houses that were eventually stricken with Sadat in order to enable the new Jewish owners to inherit these Canaanites hidden gold. We had already spoken about it, that the, the Canaanites, some of them, hid their gold in the walls of their homes. And now, with the Tzadat, the Jews were going to be able to find it. So God was not, it wasn't so much an affliction, it was a gift. Since, as we've noted, Tzadat only affected the homes of exceptionally righteous individuals. Again, so we have this idea, it's, you're exceptionally righteous, you get Tzadat, but Tzadat is really spoken about as someone who's, who's uh, engaging in kind of sleazy behavior and, and malicious talk. There's this balance we find Talmudically. So maybe it's not as malicious as you and I would consider it, but to their standard, or maybe it's the Torah is talking about very righteous individuals, but we have to take it out of that context to, to, for us, you know, not just on, on regular Main Street of how what um, uh, malicious talk means to us. Either way, from the way the Torah frames it, it's it's affecting exceptionally righteous individuals who needed Sarat to help them purge themselves of the last subtlest character imperfections, which we had in earlier upset against sides. And this is kind of more of a Hasidic take on it, also always looking at the, at the positive. It follows that divine providence arranged that specifically these individuals settled in the homes that contain these new treasures. So by the, the, the divine management of the world. The, the, these righteous evolved human beings, they settled in homes where there was there was the gold, and then there was going to be the tzadahs, and then they would be able to find them. So according to the Zohar, which is the basic textbook of, of um, Torah mysticism, there was an additional reason why tzadah bro broke out in the walls of certain homes. It was not only what the, the Medrash and Talmud tell us about the, the gold there, there was another reason. The Canaanites were idolaters of such exceptional moral corruption that their spiritual depravity seeped into the very walls of their homes. I think we've discussed in the past that from a Torah perspective, what we do affects our environment. So studying Torah right now, wherever we are, the chair we're sitting on, the room we're in, it's though the though the those that those uh, sound waves, this the the holiness of it seeps into it's it it's our atmosphere, it seeps into the walls, it seeps into our things. The opposite is also true. When what we're exercising is not holiness. So their moral corruption, it it, it was, in, in a spiritual way, it, it, it really infiltrated the walls of their homes. In most cases, the occupation of these homes by the new owners, God's holy people, so the Jews come into these homes, and together with the holiness of the commandments that began to be observed in these songs, beginning with the fasting of Zuzas on the doorpost, was enough to dispel the support of people. So a person, you walk into a house, come into a house, you buy a new house, you don't know what people were doing there. Maybe they were doing that nice stuff there. Maybe there was there was an immorality. It might be. There's really no way for us to know. But one thing, what we do know is what we're going to do. And when we put up a mezuzah and we uh, treat our homes as a haven and as a spring for, for, for holiness, we're, we're creating our own new reality. And in, in God's uh, um, merciful world, whatever, if there's any negativity that seeped into the walls from previous owners, our, our goodness will blunt that and overwhelm it. Mendy, yeah. um, on that note, um, it just got me thinking about how people don't like to buy houses where there was some violent crime um, yep. that occurred. Yeah. Like yep. that, that makes sense then. I mean, it, not, you know. It, it makes sense. First of all, it's, it's a little spooky psychologically. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and spiritually also, there was a negativity there. There's no question it makes sense. At the same time, I, you know, if... if if my kids needed a house and the house fit and it was a, it was a good price because uh, <laughs> someone got yeah. murdered there, we've introduced our own holiness. So yeah. it's okay. It's not going to affect us yeah, except I, for I, feeling I, I would, weird. Right. I wouldn't say that mm. uh, no reason not to do it. But uh, again, the, the idea is to, to double down on the holiness to make sure that we're there. Right. We're, 
we're reversing that. Okay. So, you see, um, if, however, the former inhabitants were especially depraved, so we go up. Even by Canaanite standards, the introduction of Jewish holiness into their homes was not sufficient to rid these, uh, rid these homes of their holy ambiance. These homes had to be partially wholly demolished. They were therefore broke out and set out. So that speaks a little bit against what I'm saying, uh, um, Debbie, except that we really can't tell that. So I, I, I think it would be a very rare case that someone would say this was uh, that what went on here was so horrible that we can't um, counteract it or destroy the home because the, the Torah is against um, waste. And uh, if there's a home and it's built and it can be used, you want to use it for holiness and not destroy it and and have uh, faith in God that we're, we're doing the right thing. We'll be able to, as I say, blunt or overwhelm the negativity. Here, it, it, the Torah is saying that the Canaanite standards, which were so de depraved, some of them, the normal way of, of Torah life was not going to be enough to rid their homes of the, of the evil ambience. And therefore, there was going to be tzarat so that we demolish and, and rebuild. And there's no more tzarat, and therefore there's no more really, there's no more, uh, there are no more uh, situations that I can think of where a Torah would tell us to deliberately demolish a home rather than use it as it is or, or, or better it to use it for something proper, uh, holy and proper. I just have one point from a real sure. estate perspective. There's oh yeah, sorry. Well, <laughs> ask and say, you know, where's there a death in this house? And they will not buy the house, or if someone passed away, or a suicide. Really? Yes. So that gets back to you know your point. Yeah, and I can understand that, but I guess those are bargains. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, don't, I, I I guess I can understand, but I I wouldn't see any. I don't see any reason total wise not to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if someone sometimes, if a person where they were, when they were living there and they lost a loved one there or something, you know, I can totally see that because it's it's psychological. I don't think it's it's a spiritual mandate, but something you know, you got to move on and and uh, reframe and and uh, open up a new chapter in life. So, uh, you know, uh, if I if I uh, over time, when I've seen someone who they, they lost a child in a house or something, they want to move makes perfect sense to me. Because mm -hmm. it's not because the house is haunted; it's because they they're 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 haunted, and the house reminds them of of their of their of of their, of their, their terrible experience. And even though that is not going to just leave because they leave, it, they'll stop having all these stark reminders. That makes sense. But that someone else passed away, someone I didn't know. Like I say, if, if if one of my kids wanted to buy it and it was a, it was a good deal because of that, I would, I would go for it just to make sure the mezuzahs are good and that we're doing good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And thus follows. It would that it was specifically the most depraved of the Canaanites who hid their gold in their walls of their homes. Indeed, it stands to reason that only the worst Canaanites would not resign themselves to God's plan for the Jewish people to take possession of the land and stubbornly harbor hopes of eventually driving them out. So the Canaanites, you have some of them are more specifically depraved. Some of them are more specifically resistant to God. They know what's going on. They know that God has, has given this to the Jewish people. And they're thinking, okay, but we're going to come back and maybe we'll even help the Jewish people come to come depraved and th then they'll be expelled. So they're planning on that. They're planning on the Jewish people's eventual expulsion. So they 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 leave their assets in the in the walls that God says, I'm not going to let that stand. And there'll be righteous people who will come. And then they're going to have the tzaras and they'll dismantle the walls and partially because, you know, there was such an evil there and now they'll be able to, to get their their uh, treasures. Further follows, the divine providence also arranged that the exceptionally righteous Jews would be drawn to inhabit specifically the homes of the most depraved Canaanites, as we just said. This too stands to reason for the preternatural evil internalized in these homes could only be outmatched by the preternatural righteousness of these individuals through the outbreak of tzaraz that affected them specifically. This pairing of the highest levels of holiness with the lowest levels of evil is in fact characteristic of tzaraz in general. So you have 
high level evolved people living in homes where they were specifically the lowest of the low living. Well, that brings that, that to mind Sarat, because as we've noted, the repercussions of contracting Sarat are the most severe of all types of ritual impurity, necessitating ostracism from society. So on the scale of, of uh, ritual impurities, Sarat is, is, is the bottom of the barrel. On the other hand, the purpose of Sarat is to purify the individual to the degree unattainable by human effort. And therefore, this affliction is awarded only to those who have spiritually found themselves to the maximum extent uh, of humanly possible. So Tzarat is, is an example of that dichotomy, where it's it's a treated on the scale of Jewish law, on the, on the, on the, uh, the bottom of the barrel of, of uh, level of spiritual impurity, and yet what they can achieve in going through it is beyond the norm of the 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 continuum of of, uh, of uh, the um, self actual uh, spiritual self uh, self actualization. In other words, as we have seen, sincere repentance, chuva, elevates us to degrees of divine consciousness inaccessible to holy righteous individuals. Since Sarah sp struck stuck struck specifically people who seemingly had nothing to repent for, it enabled even these people to achieve the closeness of God. Normally reserved for people who have repented for some as deep. So it was it was making the good better. All this, although this held true of Tsaras in general, it was most clearly seen in the Tsaras of homes. Why? Because there the sufferer was report, rewarded openly by suddenly requiring the, wor the worldly wealth hidden in his walls. The reason for this is that, as has been pointed out, about, uh, of the three venues for Tsaras, which was, it was on the skin, the clothing in the home, the home, we say, is the most external and is therefore the physical correlate of the most sublime aspect of the soul, which is the most removed from our normal of consciousness. I guess it just explains a little bit. These are kind of lofty spiritual ideas that I'm trying to put into a sentence. In our own spiritual consciousness, you think about yourself, you think about your feelings, and you think about where you are with God. There's what you can connect with. Then... If you want to really close your eyes and meditate or study, you can think about things that, you know, that there's a godliness beyond you. And maybe you can't fully grasp, but you can sense that there's something greater, that there's an infinite. How do you grasp an infinite? You can't grasp an infinite. And you can't totally visualize an infinite, but you need to feel. So when something is, is, is beyond us, to the extent we can't, grasp it it's not concrete it's not so um so definable but it's beyond us it, it, with the languages it's it hovers above us or it's beyond us it's not something that's that i grab and i own it's in my back pocket in my mind my idea it's it's a, a feeling of like faith which is is something which is it, it's a, appreciable but it's not so graspable and the the so therefore the the home represents something that's the, the walls and the ceiling. It's beyond me. It surrounds me. It's it's uh, it, I live in it. I benefit from it. I I know it's here. It's not something that I can get my arms around. And therefore, so that's in a physical sense. That, that doesn't mean anything great about a home. But if we want to translate it into the spiritual, it means the ideas the levels of the soul that we can only approximate and that we can't fully get our arms around it. And this is the quintessential core of the soul, termed the chiba. Chiba, we translate here as unique one, whose consciousness is entirely that of being one with God. It is from the perspective of this level of the soul, which is synonymous with God's own perspective, perspective that the true nature of Tzavad, a gift tool for transcendent spiritual refinement, is most evident. This is how we should view any apparent misfortune or seeming setback in life. It is God's way of elevating us to a level of relationship with him that we could not have reached on our own. This is a very important um, end game here. That the tzarat is it was a pain in the neck. It was a hassle. But the point is that God gives us hassle sometimes um, for us to be able to wrestle with them, keep our bearings, keep our morality, keep our patience with loved ones, keep our focus, and actually grow more to, to places we couldn't have grown without the challenges. We don't look for challenges. We, we pray for uh, growth without challenges. But sometimes 
The challenges did bring growth. Hopefully all the times. Let's go back up to verse 35. Let's see if we can finish this, this uh, page. 30, um, verse 35. When a lesion appears on a house, the owner of the house must come and tell the priest about it, saying, something resembling a lesion has appeared on my house. Even if the owner is familiar with the signs of Tzedas and is sure that the lesion is Tzedas, he must not state this fact decisively. He must leave that to the priest. He says, it looks like it. Why? Because unless he's a priest himself, who is he to um, definitively assess it? 36. The priest must order that the house be cleared out before he, the priest, comes into, in, inside to examine the lesion, so that everything in the house not become ritually defiled, if he indeed pronounce, pronounces the lesion to be Surat. The priest is going is called, and if he if he says, yes, this is Surat, then immediately everything in the house becomes affected by it. So you got to get everything out onto the, to the lawn. And then he'll look at just the bare walls and, and the house and the, the ceiling. True, the wooden, if he indeed, if he indeed pronounces the lesion to be tzerat, for even if the lesion is tzerat, nothing in the house becomes defiled until the priest pronounces it to be true, to be so, true. The wooden or metal utensils in the house can later be purified, ritual defilement by immersing them in mikveh, and the wood in the house can be consumed by someone who happens to be defiled at the time. However, as you know, earthenware vessels cannot be purified, ritual defilement by immersion. So once these become ritually defiled, you're sunk. They may never again be used for ritually undefiled food. It's therefore for the sake of these vessels that the house must be emptied out. That's also because you don't want to schlep everything to the mikveh. The repercussions of the original defilement contracted by a house afflicted with tzeraz are quarantined for the suspected tzeraz are the same for those of the original defilement of men who have suffered two or more discrete non-seminal discharges, which will be discussed in detail later in, at the end of this Torah portion. After this, the priest must come to examine the house. He must examine the lesion. If the lesion on the walls of the house appears on the stones of the walls, covers it, or, or, and B, covers it at least an area equivalent to a rectangle two of whose sides are equal to the diameter of a Cilician bean, and those two other sides are equal to twice the diameter of a Cilician bean. I hope you're taking notes. And C, consists of pure green or pure red, sunken-looking stains, of stains of a mixture of both colors, appearing to be deeper than the wall. Then, we'll just go to 109, and finish it here. The priest must go out of the house, to the entrance of the house, and must quarantine the house for seven days. You know, maybe I've got another few uh, verses here. 39. Then the priest must return on the seventh day and examine the house. If the lesion has appeared or turned a lighter or darker shade of uh, red or green, the affected area must be scraped, and the priest must then pronounce the house rid of this defilement. If, however, the lesion has spread on the walls of the house, the house must be purged as follows. First, on 40, the, person must, uh, the priest must order the stones upon which the lesion is found to be removed. And those who remove, remove them must dispose of them outside the city to a designated place that either already is that is or that will become nearby become defiled. As long as defiled stones are in this place, anyone who enters that place becomes defiled. 41. In addition to removing the affected stones, the workers must scrape out their house from the inside, but only all around the vicinity of the removed stones. They must pour out the mortar dust that they removed outside the city, specifically into the final place, as they did with the stones. 42. They must then take other unaffected stones and bring them to replace them with stones. And one of the workers must take other mortar dust and plaster the new stones into the wall of the house. Well, let's leave it over here. We'll pick this up uh, next week. We're making some good progress. So, unless there are any questions, wish you all a wonderful week. And uh, probably next Tuesday, if not before. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.